Good morning, and boy, has it been a week. We have a jam-packed show today on the Cross Connection, including the millions who are still left in the dark following Hurricane Ida, and the millions struggling to survive as enhanced unemployment benefits end this weekend. But we have to begin with the latest on Texas's new abortion law, which honestly seems like something straight out of Gilead. Last night, a Texas judge handed a narrow legal victory to abortion rights advocates when she temporarily blocked an anti-abortion group from enforcing the restrictive law against Planned Parenthood. Now, let's take a look at this new law. Not only does it ban the procedure after six weeks of pregnancy, before many women even know they're pregnant, but it also provides no exceptions for rape or incest. And it relies on citizens, regular citizens just like you and me, to enforce it, basically letting them sue anybody who helps a woman get an abortion. And it awards them 10 stacks if they succeed. The most pernicious thing about the Texas law, it sort of creates a vigilante system where people get rewards to go out to, anyway. And it just seems, I know this sounds ridiculous, almost un-American, what we're talking about. President Biden says the Justice Department is looking at the legality of the new restrictive abortion law. But this is a huge blow to Roe v. Wade. It has spurred Democratic leaders to try to codify the protections into federal law after the Supreme Court just allowed it to stand. But no surprise, other states are already working to use the law as a blueprint for copycat measures. And Texas lawmakers have advanced yet another restrictive bill limiting access to abortion medication. But honestly, you guys, it's the hypocrisy for me. These Republican lawmakers fix their mouths claiming they're pro-life, but they allow Texans to carry guns with no permit or no training. They're against the life-saving vaccine and mass mandates. So newsflash, it's not even giving you all what you think it's supposed to give. Joining me now, Amy Hackstrom Miller, president and CEO of Whole Woman's Health. Uh, she's the lead plaintiff challenging the Texas law and our pal Ellie Mastal, justice correspondent at The Nation. Amy, I'm so happy to have you with me this morning. Uh, you know, I know this judge issued this temporary um, uh, protection last night. Tell me what this means and what are your next steps? So this temporary protection um, basically blocks Texas right to life, um, but it doesn't give us the kind of broad protection that we really need and that the people who are seeking abortion services really need. This blocks one organization, which I think is a great step in the right direction. This, these are the people that had that crazy uh, whistleblower site up on the Internet. And so it gives us some protection there. But Whole Woman's Health and all of the abortion funds and all of the other uh, providers in the state are seeking much broader justice than this. Um, this is a great first step, but we've got to knock this law down because the ramifications, not only across the country, but really for individual lives across the state of Texas, where people are being denied access to safe abortion in one of the largest states in our country on our watch is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Uh, Ellie, I am outraged and I'm so happy to have you on this morning because I know you're outraged, too. I've seen your tweet threads. This entire thing about protecting the fetus, when they care so little for life uh, uh, in this country, is beyond comprehension. Uh, it just feels like they really must hate women in Texas and all across the country. How is it possible the Supreme Court allowed this to stand? I know that they haven't ruled on it, uh, but they can rule later. But we have an actual handmaid on the court. So I have to tell you, I'm not so excited about depending on them to protect me and my right to choose. Yeah, look, if they were care cared about life, they would be giving women $10,000 for their and free health care to bring pregnancies to term, not giving people $10,000 to go rat them out to the state. So there's no it's nothing to do with life. It's everything to do with the control of women's bodies. But that's what the Supreme Court, five of those justices, that's what they're down for. Do not sugarcoat this. It's not that the Supreme Court didn't couldn't figure out how to rule. No, what the Supreme Court did was take 50 years of president that was Roe v. Wade and take 30 years of precedent that was Planned Parenthood v. Casey and throw it out the window. That's where we are now. Roe is dead because all Roe stands for is the proposition that before fetal viability, which is 24 weeks, not six, before fetal viability, the government cannot restrict a woman's right to choose. If Texas can restrict a woman's right to choose after six weeks, if Florida can do it, if South Dakota can do it, if Missouri can do it, if Arkansas can do it, if the entire former Confederacy can do it, then guess what? Roe v. Wade don't mean anything. 
And for the and I'm sorry to have to kind of immediately go here, but for the Biden administration to be saying, oh, now the Department of Justice is going to look into the legality of that. Texas passed this law in May. What do you mean you're looking into it now? Texas passed this law in May. Yes. Perhaps the Biden administration thought the Supreme Court would do something. But if they thought that they haven't been paying attention because Roe v. Wade was on the mat. Roe v. Wade was on life support the moment Ruth Bader Ginsburg slipped this mortal coil. The moment that woman start, stopped drawing breath, Roe v. Wade was in their sights. And we know this. So for the Biden administration to be like, oh, who could have thought that this, was, this is what they promised to do? So how are we not then ready with a federal response for what they have done since all they have done is what they said they were going to do? How are we not ready for that? How are how indeed and Ellie, you know, I wake up every morning and want to scream. We try to tell you we try to tell you, please. Nobody ever mentioned Susan Collins to me because she was the main one defending this. So, Amy, I want to kick it back to you, because the frightening thing about this is the incentive uh, incentivizing vigilantes. I mean, you can imagine my lived experience in this country. Vigilante justice is something that's very frightening. And we know all too well what happens when dangerous white men are in power and decide to exert that power over those uh, of us who are not in power. What does this mean for like Uber drivers who are taking a woman to an abortion clinic or a family member who's taking a woman outside the state? Or, you know, I don't think people realize we're going back to hangers and seedy hotels and things that really put a woman's life at risk. Right. First, I just have to say, Ellie, you're giving me life this morning. Um, I think we are facing not it's draconian is not even the right word. I mean, if you think about the bounty hunting, the vigilante sort of um, times in our past of, of hunting free slaves. I mean, that's the kind of law that this is. It's incentivizing vigilantes. It's incentivizing the people who have been terrorizing us at abortion clinics for decades. They are the same people who were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Literally, we saw our protesters there on the video. These folks um, are against a whole lot of things that many of us in this country believe very deeply. Um, and I think it's it's an awakening. You're right, it's an awakening far too late. Uh, Governor Abbott signed this bill early in May, but there's been a trajectory of restrictions on people's access to abortion in the Midwest and the South for decades. And we're what's emerging are you know, rights that depend upon where you live and they depend upon your race and your class and who you happen to be near and who can pay for you. This is not the United States that we're trying to build. And so we've got to look at the impact on the people on the ground, our clinic staff who are being put in the position of being agents of the state today, turning people away who they are fully prepared and committed to help. This is cruel and it's inhumane and it should not be happening on our watch. It's inhumane. And look, to get back to the, the gun law, they also passed, Ellie, where you can carry a weapon, no training, no permit. It is not unreasonable to think that one of these crazy yahoos will think, well, I've got to protect this woman. Ergo, I'm going to use this weapon to do so. We've seen similar things happen across this country. We're seeing other states use this, South Dakota, Mississippi, Mississippi, who has a case before the Supreme Court. So legally, Ellie, what can be done? What should we be demanding of the Biden administration uh, to immediately Immediately bring this to a screeching halt. I heard your frustration, but what I'm looking for is how do we stop this? None of this is easy, guys, and none of this is clean. And to stop these people at this point, it's going to require some creativity, and it's going to require the Biden administration willing to get its hands dirty. There are solutions here, but there's no silver bullet. There's nothing that Biden can do and then stay behind like, oh, this is institutionally the way that things. No, no, no. You have to be creative. You have to be willing to get. You have to be willing to go buck wild in order to stop them. So. One option would be for Biden to federalize doctors, to hire a federal force of doctors, send them into Texas to protect people's constitutional rights. Because the Texas law is only enforceable through private civil action, federal employees are protected from private civil lawsuits through the doctrine of qualified immunity, which most of the time I hate. But you know what? Let's turn it around on them and protect people who are providing constitutionally protected medical services. Now, that could run into problems with the Hyde Amendment. One way to get around the Hyde Amendment is to not pass it in the next budget, by the way. Right. That's also something we could do. The Hyde Amendment is not a constitutional principle. We could just not pass it in the budget. Boom. No Hyde Amendment. But 
since, again, apparently this country is run by Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, perhaps that is not an option. So one way to get around the Hyde Amendment is to make abortions free. Now, I could argue they already should be free. There's no reason why a poor woman should have to pay, especially since they can't use Medicaid in order to um, pay for abortions under the Hyde Amendment. So you just make the abortions free. You make the doctors privately funded. I know that private funding of, uh, of, of uh, state uh, public-private partnerships can get around state regulations because I saw Republicans do it all the time with the private prison system. So I know that right. works, right? So that will get you around the Hyde Amendment in that uh, situation. There's also federal enclave law. Now, that would allow military bases to basically perform medical services without being sued um, by, again, private citizens. Now, again, you have some Hyde Amendment problems there. That would probably be litigated. I would tell the Supreme Court to go enforce their Hyde Amendment bubbles while we're protecting constitutional rights. And finally, there's various laws on the books, and, and uh, this this is where we are at, that were meant to stop the Klan, to stop Jim Crow measures that perhaps could be taken against private citizens who are clanning themselves up only this time to stop women from accessing their constitutional rights. There's a there's a law, and it's it would be very hard. It's a difficult legal case, all right? I'm not trying yeah. to blow smoke here. Like, it's difficult to make these arguments, but you could argue that people acting under the color of law, as private citizens are, to deprive people of their rights is a violation of U.S. Code uh, Section 42, 1983. Yeah. So, like, there, there are things we can do. None of it is clean. None of it is easy. All of it should be done now. All of the above is what we should be doing now. And giving women as much access to their constitutionally protected freedoms as possible until Democrats pack the court. Yeah. And, and honestly, the Texas Taliban is completely out of step with the rest of the country because the majority of Americans support um, legal uh, and safe uh, abortions. But honestly, who cares what everybody thinks except for the woman carrying the child? So thank you so much, Amy uh, Hacksha Miller and Ellie Mistal, for bringing context to all of this. Are we going to see a repeat of January 6th in a few weeks? You are not going to believe this. We're going to talk about this upcoming March in September. Stay with us. Hey, everybody, it's Hoda Kotb and Jenna Bush Hager. And we got big news, y'all. Our show is now a podcast. That's right. You can take us anywhere you go in your car, to the gym, even just at home on your own couch with a glass of wine. We like spending time with each other, and now we love that we can spend even more time with you. Are you sick of us yet? No, don't be, because you can <laughs> never have to miss a moment of fun, laughs, or friendship. Yeah, subscribe. Listen to Today with Hoda and Jenna wherever you get your podcasts. Controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. Listen now on Apple Podcasts. All right, those that deny history are doomed to repeat it. And we may be seeing a rerun of January 6th in just a few weeks. That's right. This is when extremist groups are planning a rally to demand justice, in quotes, for those who have been charged in the original insurrection. And this is according to the AP and CBS News. Now, in this climate, it would be wise for Republican lawmakers to watch their words and not pour any fuel on this fire. Because quite frankly, you all only bring that smoke when you're not outnumbered like Rep. Madison Cawthorn of North Carolina, who was caught on tape this or last week saying this. If our election systems continue to be rigged and continue to be stolen, then it's going to lead to one place, and that's bloodshed. Hmm. Joining me now, former Republican congressman of Florida, Carlos Curbelo, and political strategist Lucy Caldwell, uh, two of my favorite people to have these discussions with. Um, congressman, I, I have to start with you because this march that's uh, happening or planned for September 18th, what I find baffling but not quite surprising is that they actually invite members of Congress to participate. Do you think that some of your former colleagues uh, in, in the House or the Senate will actually show up to this march? And if so, who? I think a handful probably will, uh, the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene and others. I mean, that's what has happened to the Republican Party, Tiffany. I'll give you some perspective. When I arrived in Congress in 2015, 
the most extreme Republicans were those who refused to vote for any tax increases, who would only vote for budgets uh, that would cut government spending. And while we disagreed with their tactics, I mean, it's OK to have a debate about the size and role of government. Today's extremist Republicans are people who believe in lies, who promote violence. So the party has changed drastically. Uh, there's definitely a before and after Donald Trump. And that's why it's possible even for people to come up with an, an idea like this kind of march to defend criminals. And it's conceivable and sad that some members of Congress might actually show up to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the, the crazy part, that it's actually conceivable. So, Lucy, I, I'll ask you, um, you know, in, we're seeing this slate of kind of crazy candidates, right? Like, I'm looking at Herschel Walker out of Georgia, um, the accusations made against him by his ex-wife, things he admitted on his own, um, very Trumpian candidates uh, running for the Senate and even for the lower chamber in the House. This is going to create a nightmare for folks like Mitch McConnell, who's a nightmare for the rest of us, when he's really tried to, you know, get away from this Trump mantra, but this is the monster they created. He is Frankenstein, and this is the monster he created. How are you advising people to vote down ballot since you're still a Republican? Yeah, well, fortunately for me, I am not still a Republican because I could ah. not possibly be associated with the things happening at the top of the ballot, but also even further down than you're talking about. I mean, look, here's the real table stakes. There is no post-Trump party where all these Republicans wake up and that's fantasy, right? The good news is the Republican Party is becoming more of a regional party. The bad news is that's good news for people who care about democracy. The bad news is it's not happening nearly fast enough. And, you know, people are very focused on the Senate and the House race, races. I'm really focused on what's happening even lower down. Right now, redistricting mm. is going on. Democrats control only 11 states when it comes to redistricting. Republicans have massively outpaced them. You're going to see even worse districts. You have gobs of Republican governors who could not get elected today, who are going to be termed out. And we are not seeing a return to normalcy. There's an article in ProPublica this week about how Steve Bannon, who kind of embodies the proto-fascism that is now the Republican Party, has made quick work of installing people at every level, precinct committeemen, you know, election clerks, you name it. And so I would say to people, unfortunately, no matter how near and dear former tenants of the Republican Party are to you, ideas like fiscal conservatism or the size and scope of government, those are kind of irrelevant when you have people at the lowest levels of Republican races claiming that the election was stolen or that we need to, you know, fight off the enemy from within. You know, this is not your grandma's Republican Party. And this is something that we have to be on guard of. School board races, every yeah. level. Yeah. And let me just say, your grandma's Republican Party wasn't so kind to a lot of people in the country either. Fair. I want to circle back with Fair. you on that, Lucy. Uh, but let me turn to, to Congressman Curbelo. Take a listen to some of the uh, candidates, and I want to ask you about it on the other side. This woman who tried to break the contract not to compete and then accused me of hitting on her. That's how, that's how she put it. If you had seen her, you would uh, know that the picture would be a complete defense. I'm just saying. They held a gun to my temple and said... He was going to blow my brains out. Congressman, I ask you every time you're on, I'm going to ask you again. When you have these folks who are on the ballot, let's say they go on to win the GOP primary. You've got Marco Rubio in Florida, like we've talked about, who at this point is essentially a Trump acolyte. You've got Val Demings running the Senate uh, for, against him to, for that Senate seat. If these folks are going to keep allowing the kind of behavior that we've seen, they're going to keep paving the way for other marches like this to happen. Uh, they are pretty much adopting every MAGA talking point. What do you advise people to do when voting down ballot? Particularly, will you support Marco Rubio, given what we've heard from him under the Trump era? Well, Tiffany, I'll tell you, those clips that you just played, they remind me of Todd Akin. Sharon Angle, Roy Moore in Alabama. So if Republicans do nominate those kinds of candidates, it is very likely that they will lose. Sure, uh, during uh, the midterm elections, the op opposition party tends to gain seats, but that's not always the case. And Mitch McConnell does have nightmares about some of these candidates because they have cost him seats in the past. So you can expect McConnell to try to avoid some of these people making the November ballot. But 
uh, Republicans will get punished if they put forward these kinds of candidates. And I will say, I mean, uh, uh, compared to, to, to some of these clips we just heard of some of these candidates, they do make people like Marco Rubio seem a, a lot more centrist and moderate. Uh, but even in a state like Alabama, OK, uh, where a Democrat won something inconceivable to a lot of people, that can happen again. And don't count Donald Trump out. He can save this election for Democrats. A lot of people give him credit for Democrats winning two Georgia Senate seats at the end of last year. Uh, Donald yeah. Trump can make that possible again for Democrats. Yeah, I don't know how many people think Marco Rubio is a, a centrist or moderate at this point. He's kind of a part of that MAGA crowd. But I'm going to keep inviting you on, and we're going to keep talking about it uh, as this Florida uh, Senate race gets closer. Lucy, we're way over time, but I want to ask you this question, because um, we talked a little bit about it. White women are a big supporter of the Republican Party, and it's kind of baffling to me because you see these anti-choice uh, laws um, coming out, and the Republican Party does not adopt um, policies, you know, when it comes to, like, health care and child care, et cetera. Why do you you think a majority of white women continue to be loyal to the Republican Party? Look, I think that this goes back to what a regional party the party has become, but that the Republican Party has really succeeded in really messaging itself as the party of the family, the party of school choice, the party of you know what's best for your family. I mean, for a lot of Republicans, the kind of Obama era Julia uh, meme, that doesn't, yeah. that doesn't work for them. And so I think that that is really what you see. But I mean, frankly, with all due respect to Congressman Curbelo, the fact that we're in a moment where even Republicans who have spoken out against Trump or about against this sort of fascism don't even feel that they can say unequivocally that they will not support people like Marco Rubio. That is, and I mean this with the utmost respect, that is the same thing happening in these individual communities of, say, white women who don't feel like they can break away. So we have to figure out how to how to change that. But Tiffany, let me just let me just tell you real quick, if Republicans nominate candidates like the ones we just saw on this screen, those white women will abandon them and they will vote for Democrats. They have done it in the past. They will do it again. We, we have not seen that in droves, I have to tell you, uh, Congressman. But you guys are my favorite to have this healthy exchange of ideas and ideology with. So I really appreciate it. And I do, before I let you go, just want to read a statement um, that CNN asked Larry Elder uh, about this incident that we played earlier um, last week in an interview. And he responded, the whole point behind your series of question is, do I respect women? And I don't. I have a great deal of respect for women. I've never been accused of sexual harassment. I've never been accused of sexual abuse. Very confusing statement. Statement, but I at least wanted to read it. But Congressman, I know you had a busy Saturday, so thanks for making time for the show. And Lucy, I always love talking to you. So thank you, Lucy Caldwell and former Congressman Carlos Corbello. We'll see you next time. Coming up next, some Louisiana residents affected by Hurricane Ida may not see their power back on until the end of the month. This is absolutely shameful. We're going to talk about the problem with the power company right after the break. Stay with us. Being in a hotel with no electricity, it gets hot. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> I just want to get our power back on. I have kids, and it's very hot. I just went and bought some fans, hoping they help. It's going on long enough. So I just wish that we get our electricity soon. New Orleans has got to do better. The state's got to do better for us when these storms come through. All right, today marks the sixth day without power for just under 600,000 customers in southern Louisiana. Now, for some people, it could be days or even weeks before electricity is fully restored. This kind of catastrophic power failure was not supposed to happen, but it did. Thanks in part to Entergy, the electric monopoly in New Orleans. Now, Energy used the specter of a storm, just like Ida, to build a natural gas power plant in New Orleans East, streamrolling black Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese, American, and Latino residents who fought against it. Energy even hired actors to parade as citizens at city council meetings, blocking actual residents from having their say, all while promising the plant would jumpstart the city after a hurricane. So the mothers worry they will die from heat stroke and cooling their kids in cars and folks spending their nights by candlelight. They want answers and help. Joining me now is Logan Atkinson Burke. She's the executive director at the Alliance for Affordable Energy. Logan, thanks so much for being here. It's a nightmare to watch these people go through this. And, you know, I've watched interviews with mothers in the car with their kids. 
How exactly did energy fail the citizens of Louisiana? Well, thanks for having me, Tiffany. Um, what we're seeing is not nearly enough information, actually, about how Entergy has failed uh, the communities, both in New Orleans and surrounding. You, you mentioned uh, that some folks are not expected to have power for weeks. Uh, I want to make sure that we're definitely talking about those folks in the coastal parishes, the river parishes, who are being um, kept in the dark, both literally and metaphorically, in terms of information about what has happened here? What was the real failure when we were told over and over that this particular power plant was going to solve everyone's problems? So what does this mean um, for people who live in these neighborhoods? You know, I think it is very striking that this takes place, um, that the, the pipeline, the power plant was built in a predominantly black and Vietnamese neighborhood. I've been uh, to that neighborhood in 2005 after Katrina struck. Um, what's the danger for having something like this in this neighborhood? Well, the very communities in Louisiana who are bearing the brunt of these um, climate change exacerbated storms are the very same communities that have historically been bearing the environmental injustices of the fossil fuel industry. That's true of most of our power plants in the state. That's also true of the petrochemical plants, the refineries, the fertilizer plants. These folks who have been forced to effectively be a sacrifice zone for uh, for the fossil fuel industry for chemicals are now also a sacrifice zone to this electric uh uh, investor owned utility who has right. been centering shareholder profit over people for years. And I, I think that's true of a, a lot of energy. I mean, this is why we have to have these conversations, right? Um, my colleague, Ali Velshi talked a bit about this in the last hour about, um, you know, why can't we just go hard and, you know, look at renewable energies. But let me, let me just say energy said in, in 2018 that the New Orleans East plant would be able to keep powering through hot summer days and storms. However, all eight of their uh, transmissions lines into or New Orleans failed. Um, what happened here? Well, what happened here is a failure to plan for the century we're in, a failure to plan for climate change and the storms that are coming faster and harder, and a failure to listen to the communities who want not just the same old systems that are clearly not set up for this, that we've been depending on for the last century. Instead, what communities have been saying is we want solar, we want solar and storage, we want microgrids and energy efficiency, because we know that the transition transmission systems that have been ignored by the utilities um, are not going to be able to weather these kinds of storms. So how do we keep people safe and healthy when these things fail? And the answer can't be backup diesel and gas generators, because that's actually sending more people to the hospital and killing people than even floods have been doing in Louisiana the last couple of years. And so what, what the utilities have not done is listen to the communities who are their customers. What regulators must do is begin to listen to those communities who know what they need and not the utilities who know what their shareholders want. So, you know, we saw this happen in Texas uh, earlier this year for, during the winter storm. Um, you know, last summer, officials in California um, ordered rolling blackouts during a heat wave. This is something that's going to keep happening. Are the Texas and Louisiana energy grid citations, are, are they similar? Are they connected? There's no doubt that they're connected. They're connected in terms of what is fueling these kinds of storms, but they're also connected in terms of the kind of planning that we need to be doing across our electric system, not just moving to renewables. Certainly, we absolutely have to be moving to 100% renewable energy and energy efficiency, but we also have to be thinking about how do we adapt our energy systems, and that goes all the way down to the house level. How do we adapt those systems to be responsive and ready and resilient to the kinds of events that we are seeing coming, whether it's extreme cold, extreme heat and humidity, or even fire. These kinds of storms are connected. We know that Ida alone started in the Gulf of Mexico and wrought havoc all the way across, um, all the way up into New York and New Jersey and everywhere in between has been experiencing these storms. And that means we have to be planning 
to keep people safe and healthy in their homes, in their communities, because we also know we're not planning for the kinds of necessary evacuations to keep people safe. And so that's why we, we have to be focusing on people. And that's not just at the utility level. It's not just, although certainly it very much is, the, the regulatory level, um, the Louisiana Public Service Commission, the New Orleans City Council, but it's also when you look at the kinds of money that could be coming from the reconciliation bill, from the right. infrastructure bill, though that money cannot be just shunted to the fossil fuel industry for false solutions. That money must be put into the hands of people and communities who know what they need to keep themselves safe. Because yeah. what we're seeing out of this infrastructure bill is money for, for false solutions. That cannot happen. We need what, what the Biden administration has already said is they intend to focus on what they call Justice 40, which is right. spending 40 percent of this money in the communities that have been disadvantaged over time. That yeah. means this is the perfect test case to launch exactly, Justice yeah. 40. Yeah, I'm so sorry. We're running out of time, but I just wanted to hit your point. Uh, Congresswoman Cori Bush has introduced a bill to federalize uh, energy. I mean, you make a point about fossil fuels. The anachronism is in the title, fossil fuels. It's certainly time to do something different. Um, I do want to say that we did reach out to Energy for comment on this story. We didn't hear back from them. Uh, and just a little note, Energy um, pulled funding from a Black-owned station when they spoke out about it. So the finances behind these utility companies uh, are very uh, intimidating when people are trying to fight against them. So so thank you so much, Logan Burke, for joining us, uh, and uh, we'd love to have you back. Coming up next, football is back, and you know I'm excited to talk about sports, but the season returns with plenty of issues, from player vaccine controversies to nasty and belligerent fans. We're going to talk about that with Michael Smith, so stay with us. All right, are you ready for some football? The new NFL season kicks off Thursday, but some players and fans already seem to be fumbling on the snap. Here to break it down is the Cross Connection Chief Sports Correspondent and Certified Lover Boy Impersonator, Michael Smith, co host of Brother from Another on Peacock TV. Michael, you know I'm so excited to talk about all of this with you. I have to first ask this question because it's a rumor. We haven't actually confirmed this, but Cam, Cam Newton, did he really give up that bag because he did not want to get vaccinated? Uh, he definitely fumbled. Uh, we'll see how he recovers. I mean, look, I it, can't say that it was because he wasn't vaccinated that the Patriots cut him this past week. Uh, him not being vaccinated and a misunderstanding about the daily testing process uh, forced him to be away from the team for five days. And in that time, uh, the first round draft pick that the Patriots took, Mac Jones out of Alabama, he seized the moment uh, and he beat Cam out. Now, couple that with the notion that if you're an unvaccinated player, the protocols are so much stricter and you're, so, you're, you're more often in danger of missing games or missing practices if you're in close contact, all of that contributes to Cam being cut by the Patriots. So it wasn't just because he was unvaccinated, but it certainly opened the door and gave the Patriots an excuse to cut him. They'll never say that because right, the head yeah. coach in Jacksonville, Urban Meyer, is being investigated by the NFL Players Association for saying that unvaccinated or vaccinated factors in to whether or not you make the team. Which, which is kind of crazy, right? Uh, your your uh, former her of his and hers, Jamel uh, Hill, my friend, tweeted, um, you know, about players being hesitant about this. So a vaccine that's proven to be wildly effective and protects people against a potentially deadly virus will get an NFL player to retire, but not the threat of imminent brain trauma that they expose them themselves to every game. I mean, it's kind of crazy that this yeah. happens, but fine. We, we can talk about the players. I'm really interested in the fan behavior. I want you to take a look uh, at some of these fights that we've seen fans participate in, and we'll talk about it on the other side. I get shot! Shut up! Shut up! She told you to shut no. up. No! Shut up and get the f out! Don't touch me!
that first video, I'm telling you, it would have been a problem. <laughs> that, that smoke is not really invited. The second video, what is the deal with fans? Like, are, are we able to, like, have football games? It's not just the fan behavior, but it's also these mass mandates that are not really centralized. Some stadiums say you have to wear them. Some right. don't. How are you going to regulate this when they're belligerent and drunk and eating? Uh, what are we to expect right. this season? Well, uh, that remains to be seen because right now, NFL stadiums in particular are at full capacity. You have a couple of college uh, stadiums, LSU, Tulane, uh, or universities, excuse me, LSU, Tulane, uh, the Oregon schools uh, that are looking for proof of vaccination or proof of a negative COVID test. In the NFL, you have a couple of stadiums, the Superdome in New Orleans, which obviously is being compromised by Hurricane Ida, uh, and the Raiders Stadium, Allegiant Stadium. They're asking for proof of vaccination, and the Raiders Stadium is also offering vaccinations outside the stadium. And if you get in, you could wear a mask. But uh, you're right. It's going to be a mess, not to mention local and state uh, policies that are going to influence right. this, because right now it's full capacity. As we get deeper into this this surge, uh, they could end up starting to limit it, uh, limit the amount yeah. of people uh, that can gather in various places. But just real, one quick point, uh, which you were making about the players. Ninety three percent of players are vaccinated. Let's point that out. Ninety three percent are and one player, Denzel Perriman of the aforementioned Raiders, said yesterday, I'm tired of being an outcast. Uh, so I can't even eat with my guys. I'm thinking about getting the vaccine. So there's anti-vaxxers and there's vaccine hesitancy, which right. as time goes on, maybe more players and maybe more fans will be inspired either to get in these games or they'll see their their you know favorite players getting vaccinated and, and wise up. So. We'll yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you made that point. Uh, we're way over time. I wanted to ask you about this uh, Bishop Sycamore thing at ESPN, but we're running out of time. But seriously, what kind of decisions does ESPN make? I'm so probably confused best. by this company. Uh, anyway, probably best yeah, that we're out of time on that best. one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our chief Happy cross to be connections. Your sports correspondent. Our chief sports correspondent, Appreciate Michael you. Smith. You have to promise to come back. Chief. I know you're busy That's on right. Saturdays. We're going to get you back. Thanks so much, Michael. And coming up next, one of our viewers asked if the president can make an election day uh, a federal holiday. Can he? We'll make it make sense. That's right after the break. Welcome back to the Cross Connection. Like we always do at this time, let's make it make sense. Hello, Tiffany. This is Perry from San Francisco. I've always been wondering why Biden doesn't institute the election days as a federal holiday. I think it could easily be done something as a reconciliation, since it would save money in legal fees and hassles from every American that doesn't have convenient jobs to take off and go do voting. So I think that would be a very good use of the reconciliation. Well, thank you, Perry, for that great question. And the simple answer for why President Biden doesn't make Election Day a federal holiday by using the Senate's reconciliation process is basically because he can't. Now, remember, reconciliation is a way for Congress to bypass the Senate filibuster and its 60-vote threshold. Bills passed via reconciliation only need a simple majority to pass the Senate. But there is a catch. Only bills having to do directly with federal spending and revenue, aka taxes, can be passed this way. So a bill to make Election Day a holiday, that's really not going to cut it. But President Biden and Democrats in Congress are using reconciliation to try to pass Biden's three point trillion dollar human infrastructure plan, which includes some of his most important policies like universal pre-K and free community college tuition. But even that is looking increasingly dicey. Thanks to Senator. I love the filibuster. Joe Manchin. This alleged Democrat from West Virginia this week called for a, quote, strategic pause in Biden's agenda. Basically, your boy is threatening to vote against the bill because of some flimsy concerns he has about the national debt. Now, sadly, it's also not the first time Manchin decided to throw sand in the gears of Biden's agenda. You guys remember back in March when we demanded when he demanded a one hundred dollar reduction in unemployment benefits in exchange for his vote in a 50 50 Senate. Because of Manchin, Americans got less than they could have. And I guess Manchin got the satisfaction helping his many Republican friends whittle down a disaster relief package that they all ended up voting against anyway. Yeah. When the Senate returns on September 13th, 
We'll see if Manchin really wants that smoke or if he's just blowing it. Now, Perry, back to your question about using reconciliation for voting rights legislation. Back in July, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar did float the idea of including voting rights measures in the infrastructure package. Now, this is a long shot and would need the approval of the Senate parliamentarian, Elizabeth McDonald, who, don't forget, nixed a $15 minimum wage from the American Rescue Plan because she said it didn't meet the reconciliation rules. So the best and maybe only chance of protecting voting rights on the federal level is by abolishing the filibuster, which Manchin has already said he's just not vibing with. Who's the real president? President Joe Manchin or President Biden? Seriously, you guys, why is this guy, Joe Manchin, the most powerful person in Washington? If only I could make that make sense. Now, for those of you at home, you know the drill by now. Tweet us your 60 second or less video question about politics, policy, or current events. Post it on Twitter using the hashtag CrossConnection. Or if you don't want to be out there like that on Twitter, you can send us a video via email to CrossConnection at NBCUNI.com. Don't forget to tell us your name and where you're from. And together, we will try to make it make sense. But don't go anywhere because coming up, it's about to be a wrap for those unemployment benefits. And this is going to affect millions plus uh, the flooding and fires, how climate change is taking a disastrous toll on us all, and much, much more. That's all coming up in the next hour of Cross Connection. So stay with us. I'll see you on the other side of the break. Hey, everyone. It's MSNBC's Tremaine Lee. On my podcast, Into America, I explore what it means to be black in America. This week, I sat down with my colleagues Antonia Hilton and Mike Hicksonball to talk about their new podcast, South Lake, which dives into the fight over race, education, and belonging in a wealthy Texas suburb. When Mike and I did things as simple as just quoting what people said themselves at a school board meeting, we were treated like it was fake news. Join me for Into America. Listen now and follow wherever you get your podcasts. We're here today because Elijah McClain is not here, and he should be. He was a son, a nephew, a brother, and a friend. When he died, he was only 23 years old. He had his whole life ahead of him. And his family and his friends must now go on and live without him. Welcome back to The Cross Connection. We have a lot of trending topics to get to, but we begin with some big developments in three high-profile cases of police brutality and vigilantism, with law enforcement facing accountability for their actions. On Wednesday, three police officers and two paramedics were charged in the death of Elijah McClain. This is a 23-year-old young man who was walking home from a store in Aurora, Colorado, when police placed him in a chokehold and injected him with the sedative ketamine. This was in August of 2019. Meanwhile, in Minnesota, Kim Potter, the police officer who shot Dante Wright during a traffic stop in April, claiming she meant to use her taser instead, is now facing a new, more serious charge of first-degree manslaughter. And in Georgia, a former prosecutor was indicted for protecting the alleged vigilantes who shot and killed Ahmaud Arbery. His family says he was simply out jogging at the time of his killing. Joining me now is Versha Sharma. She's editor-in-chief for Teen Vogue, David Johns, executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition, and Christina Sinsoon Ramirez, executive director for Next Gen America. David, I want to kick it off with you because, you know, I, looking at these cases of these uh, three black men who were killed unnecessarily, um, you know, I, I see, yes, there are consequences and there are charges and indictments, but honestly, there is no justice because these three men are not here. And we had to endure the pain of witnessing more black bodies being harmed and their families have to go this Christmas and next Christmas and birthdays and holidays without them. What is your thought on all of this? I appreciate you, Tiffany. Uh, and I have three thoughts, no surprise. The First is I am tired. Uh, I found out about what happened to, in the case of our brother Ahmaud Arbery the same day that I learned my guy brother had COVID. And I just want to acknowledge how frustratingly sad it is that there are so many incidents of murder. Uh, he didn't die, 
um, Elijah in particular was murdered. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery was also murdered. Uh, so I want to name that. But how sad it is that, as you stated, we don't really have the time or bandwidth to talk about the fact that their parents won't be able to hold them physically uh, while we're rushing to talk about the audacity of caucasity in the defense of white supremacy. Uh, so I remain especially frustrated when I think about what happened to our brother Elijah, because one in every four black people are killed by the police. Uh, 50 percent of people who are killed by the police have a disability. And what we know about the ways in which white supremacy works is that most black people are either born with a disability or are made to have one. And so when I think about what happened to brother Elijah uh, and those brothers and sisters and non-binary and non-conforming people whose names we'll never know, I'm frustrated by the lack of justice that will exist. I'm also more saddened by the lack of accountability. Uh, we should all be clear that the award police station issued a defense of the police saying that That's they right. maintain officers did nothing wrong. And that's sad when we think about how frighteningly terrorizing it is to be black in America. And when you consider uh, all the people who were uh, complicit, really. Um, so you're right, the Aurora police lied um, to exonerate the five police officers and paramedics who respectively choked McLean and then gave him the ketamine. Um, government officials lied to the public. Um, so this is also the case as well, Christina, uh, in the Ahmaud Arbery case. I mean, you know, this... Uh, this attorney who was charged, uh, she was basically favoring the the vigilante people who shot them. You know, she was able to find compassion for them while devaluing black life. So it shows that you really don't have to have pulled the trigger to play a role in the harm and killing of black bodies. What's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, what we see is an entire justice system which is complicit with the systemic abuse and murdering of black people across this country. In Ahmaud Arbery's case, not only did you have vigilantes videotaped uh, harassing him, shooting him, uh, that you had uh, District Attorney Jackie Johnson helping shield these vigilantes, trying to make sure that they would not be arrested, not be held accountable, and now she is facing indictment. And what I wanna say is, you know, we're seeing this is gaining traction in news because we're seeing just a small level of accountability for the people that have abused their positions of power and black bodies, black families have suffered the consequences for years, but we are seeing just a small measure of accountability because we we saw the largest protest movements in American history force the justice system to reconcile with the pain that black families have been experiencing for generations in this country. And we've got to keep pushing and standing together because that is how we got to even just the slightest level, level of accountability. And you are right, this is not justice, this is just basic accountability. And I just want to add, you know, certainly black families have dealt with this for generations. But, you know, people in the tri-state area in New York, there are a lot of Latino people who are caught up in police brutality as well. Um, so there are plenty, you know, sadly, there are plenty of hashtags to go around. Uh, Versha, I want to talk about this Kim Potter case because, um, you know, this is something uh, this happened at the same time on the heels of the uh, George Floyd murder. Um, you know, it's really interesting that this police officer claims that she thought she was using her taser. You know, I, I don't know the solution here. I don't know that a taser feels or looks like a gun. But what I do know is that police officers make these mistakes far too frequently and the casualties more often look like me. This is something that you all have discussed and addressed at uh, Teen Vogue before. What's your thoughts uh, on the way this is all playing out with people looking at this as justice, but some of us saying, nope, it's still not enough? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. And I think especially a lot of young people feel that way. Young people who have now spent their entire lives coming up with these hashtags, going to these protests, seeing these incidents of police brutality and unfortunately fatality uh, proliferating across social media. So I will say in the case of Kim Potter and Dante Wright, we know that Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison has really made accountability part of his agenda, part of his platform. And that's one reason why he's upgraded charges for her in this case. But just like you said, with, with Potter and her colleagues claiming that it was a mistake and she meant to pull a taser instead of a handgun, that's a fatal mistake that you can't be making. And she's a veteran of the police force for 26 years. How are you on the police force for 26 years making an, a fatal mistake like that that's leading to somebody yeah. else's unnecessary death? And unfortunately, what we've seen, if you even dig back into her history, is that she's been part of problematic incidents before, and yet she's still allowed to go out on these patrols um, and, yeah. and unfortunately deal with this. 
And she was training somebody at the time. She yes. had an officer uh, with her, which is ridiculous. You know, it's really hard going through life uh, like this because you have you leave your house and you have to focus on staying alive. You worry about your kids. So it's hard to focus on things like climate change, which is also something that, you know, is killing and damaging us all. Um, you know, from Hurricane Ida decimating parts of the Gulf Coast uh, to all of the other things that we're seeing play out um, in, in, in the country. Um, so we, we saw record rainfall to New York City, the, uh, the fires in California still burning and displacing thousands of people. One thing is clear. This is a problem we cannot ignore. Christina, you know, you're very active in voting rights. How do we make this a bigger issue? Because I have to say, when you leave your house and you're worried about staying alive in the moment, it's hard to think about climate change, uh, even though it's here, but it has a longer, slower impact on our lives. Well, at Next Gen America, you know, we mobilized young voters. We mobilized one in nine young voters that went out to the polls last election. And one of their top issues is climate change. And we are seeing unprecedented um, uh, uh, consequences because of climate change. Just this year alone in the Pacific Northwest, over left over 700 people dead because of climate change. Uh, the unprecedented flooding in the Northeast left nearly 50 dead. In Texas, we saw over 200 people die because of the Texas freeze. This is not even the full list of people that have been killed this year alone in our country because of climate change. And, you know, what we're, we see right now in Washington, we have an incredible 3.5 million, uh, 3.5 trillion reconciliation package that needs passed now. You know, what I see from a generation of young people that want action on climate change is that we are the largest economy in the world. Young people know we have the resources, the technology, and millions of hardworking Americans that can actually come together and solve this climate crisis. But we all know what we have are just a few politicians, particularly in the Senate, that are standing in the way of policy change. And literally, on this issue of climate change, if we don't act, we have everything to lose. And at this point, inaction is suicidal. And it is facing an entire generation of young Americans. And we are living and experiencing just a taste of what we are yeah. going to face in the near future if we don't act now. I mean, David, look, maybe not with you because you're, you know, very policy heavy. But honestly, if you think about some of our friends and conversations that we've had, you say climate change and your eyes kind of glaze over. Uh, you know, people are more prone to, to deal with things that are right in their face. A lot of people don't realize climate change is right in your face, particularly in black and brown neighborhoods. A study by the Joint Center uh, found that more than 30 percent of black New Orleans residents didn't own cars uh, when Katrina hit. So it made them difficult for them to leave in the storm. So you have all these competing things destroying our community. How can we make climate change a priority? Yeah, let's stay in this space. So as you know, Tiffany, the National Black Justice Coalition is at the intersections of racial equity and LGBTQIA plus equality. I want to even acknowledge to the point of your introduction that so many black LGBTQ people don't have houses, don't have homes. We deal with mm. housing and security. And so the thing that I grapple with in this moment of acknowledging we're living in an episode of Black Mirror, that this isn't just about climate change or natural disasters, but the policy decisions that city planners are making. This is about the lack of ethical city planning that has resulted in the widening of roads, the erasure of natural processes to deal with water and the rates at which it fell. And so I want us to be clear that we all have an obligation to think more meaningfully about climate, about this earth that we are inhabiting for a short period of time. And we need to be more thoughtful about ensuring that city planners and those who have policy making decisions at the municipal level have an understanding of and experiences with communities who are most disaffected. Yeah, uh, completely. Um, you know, uh, Versha, I just want to give you a quick two seconds before we move on. Um, climate change is something that I do think with some pockets, uh, people are into it. Uh, I know Teen Vogue, again, has uh, covered such issues. Um, what's a way that you use the issue to make it more palatable to people and make people more engaged around the subject? Well, I think it's exactly what you're doing now, honestly. I think Teen Vogue does do a great job of this, but I think where national news media is often failing when they're covering these disasters is that they're not linking them to climate change. They're not bringing right. on climate yeah. scientists who are pointing out that the crisis is actually making hurricanes, floods, wildfires worse. There is a very direct scientific link there. And so we try to point that out in every single story that we cover about disasters or destruction. And I think, you know, Media Matters does a great job of 
covering tallies on this score. And they put out data this week that showed that way more cable news and broadcast news segments that covered Hurricane Ida and its destruction did not mention climate change versus segments that did. So thank you for doing this. I'm very appreciative that MSNBC does cover it in this way. I'm proud to work at a a network that prioritizes this. Um, So, David, I want to kick this back to you, because this is something we got to talk about. In just two weeks, Lil Nas X will release his debut album, Montero, and it's featuring artists like Elton John, Meg Thee Stallion, and Doja Cat. But on Twitter, a user questioned the lack of black men on the album, um, prompting Lil Nas X to basically pointing out that it's, you know, white men, uh, no black men are uh, on the album. And he responded and said, well, maybe a lot of them just don't want to work with me. Look. He could have a point. I'm curious your thought. But I did think about when I read that a lot of people work with Frank Ocean. You know, he's worked with everybody from Kanye to ASAP Rocky to Quavo. Do you think there is an effort like we really don't want to work with Lil Nas X um, or is it something else? Uh, see all of the above, right? This is what I hear Freeman Robowski say, let's be liberated by the beauty of both and not beholden to the tyranny of either or. I want to celebrate first that Montero Lamar Hill is a marketing genius and I celebrate his growth. What I read him say recently is that he's really celebrating being in a space where he has less regard for what people say about his career and appreciating the ability to own his power. We in this country have to deal with homophobia. It's not something that's specific to the black community. It's something that exists in the world. And what's important to me about this is that, again, Lil Nas X is owning his power. I celebrate that Kid Cudi has stepped up to the plate to say, I love to frolic in the fields with you and sing about our pain. I hope that there are other entertainers who step up to the plate and know that it'll benefit them. It's interesting that you started with our brother, uh, Frank Ocean. Uh, I think that a lot of people hope that he would have the career that Lil Nas X is having at this yeah. moment. We should all be clear that when it became ex- Explicit that Frank Ocean was singing about being at least queer, at most bisexual, that there were a lot of people who decided not to mess with him. And that's a dynamic that we still have to deal with in this country generally and in the black community more specifically. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge that it is a deity's 40th birthday today. Queen B uh, is turning 40. So, Versa, I just want to get in one question to you before we go, because um, as Beyonce turns 40, someone who was a Beyonce stan, Kanye, uh, he released his album. I got to tell you all, Kanye has long been canceled for me, but I talk to a lot of younger people who are, you know, like, oh, I like the album. It's great. He invited, um, he had Kim Kardashian on stage with him at his debut uh, concert. But the crazy thing is he invited Donald Trump to join him. One, what a weirdo. Two, Donald Trump is so pressed and thirsty for attention, he would go to the opening of an envelope. Why do we think Donald Trump didn't show up? That, that is a great question, actually. I would I would like to know what the insight is there. I have no idea what Trump world is thinking on that score. But I can tell you what that means for Kanye and, and the fan base that he has left, because I will say, just like yourself, a lot of younger people and especially women and especially black women understand what Kanye has done to the community and to his own brand over the years. And I think the, the ju- juxtaposition of Lil Nas X today and Kanye today is really interesting to me. I yeah. agree with David. Lil Nas X is a genius. He speaks yeah. truth to power in a way that we haven't seen in a very long time. Kanye West, 16 years ago this week, is when he said George Bush doesn't care about black people in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. And 16 years later, he's inviting a white supremacist former right. president who was impeached twice to be on stage with yeah. him. It's just it's, a, it's an Crazy. unfortunate evolution for his career, I think. I agree. But I'm glad to focus on younger people like Lil Nas X. Totally. Right. And I got to play Kanye now by interrupting you because we're way over time. Uh, but they made him hate himself and love their wealth. So you played yourself, playboy. <laughs> but thank you so much. Versa Sharma and David Johns and Christina Sensoon Ramirez. You guys are a great panel on this Beyonce birthday. But coming up, millions will lose their unemployment benefit uh, on this side of all weekends, Labor Day. Julian Castro and California Congressman Mark McConnell join me next to discuss. And a program note, on Wednesday, be sure to watch Memory Box, Echoes of 9-11. This is a new documentary that tells the story of September 11 through personal recollections recorded from a video booth, both right after 9-11 and now, 20 years later. Be sure to catch that special. That's at 10 p.m. Eastern this Wednesday right here on MSNBC. And you can can stream it exclusively on our streaming network, Peacock. Really dope stuff on there, so you guys ought to check it out. We'll be right back. All right, this weekend, seven and a half million people who are out of work will lose their financial lifeline as enhanced federal unemployment benefits are set to expire. Now, 26 states have already cut off that relief, 
But after doing that, only one out of eight workers in those states was able to find a job. And while August unemployment rate dropped slightly, only 235,000 jobs were added last month. And this fell way short of economists' estimates. So with COVID still impacting the economy, the loss of jobless benefits is an ankle weight for folks who are already drowning, especially for people who can't work because of child care or health concerns. This is also happening when the eviction moratorium has expired. Joining me now, former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Julian Castro, and Congressman Mark Zaccano of California. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to start with you because there are people right now who have no idea how uh, they're going to pay their rent. They have no idea where they're going to sleep in a month. And it's like the disenfranchised people of this country are being bled by a thousand cuts. You were the uh, former head of HUD. What's the impact of seeing millions of people become homeless? Well, the impact is misery for millions of families across the United States. In every state in our union, uh, people of different backgrounds, uh, in these red states and uh, in some blue states as well, although, you know, many of those states may have a bigger social safety net commitment. But what you have is uh, millions of people uh, who don't know where they're going to be sleeping uh, in two weeks, in a month, two months. And we know that housing is one of the most stabilizing forces in somebody's life. If you have a safe, decent, affordable place to live, uh, you are more likely to be able to get a decent education if you're a kid, to focus on your academic work. You're more likely to get a job because you have that stability. Uh, your health is going to be better. So you have that. And then you have uh, 7.5 million people falling off of this un unemployment insurance cliff. That's the biggest number of people that we've seen on record. Uh, at the same time, you have the uh, Delta variant, the coronavirus, surging in many states right now, hospitalizations surging. So it's this maelstrom of misery that is being created. Um, a maelstrom of misery. I, I mean, that's the, probably one of the only things that we can use to describe this, Congressman. Um, you know, you wear a few different hats here. So I'm curious your thought. You're a former classroom teacher. Um, you uh, signed on to this letter advising uh, Biden to focus on hunger right here in the country, which sadly is about to be um, a, a bigger issue. And you just introduced a bill for a 32 hour work week. Um, Given all the confluence of all the challenges happening, you've got benefits running out, the eviction moratorium is gone, there are no safety nets for people. What is Congress going to do about this? How is the federal government going to provide some sort of safety net to the people who are being impacted by this? Because I have to say, it does not seem like it's been a huge priority for anyone in Congress, quite frankly. Well, Tiffany, I'm really glad you're raising uh, the issues that you've raised, uh, the, the less than stellar unemployment uh, numbers that came out on Friday, uh, the, the persistent and rising uh, COVID-19 threat through uh, the Delta variant. All of these things, I think, are, are things that uh, have changed, should change the expectations of Congress and, and the American people. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, what led some to kind of trim back unemployment. Uh, we actually originally had unemployment benefits extended throughout through the rest of the year and at $600 a week. Uh, the thinking was then that among some to trim it back. Um, but I think that is uh, at this point, I think a mistake uh, that they need to revisit that, 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 that thinking was based on expectations that were being, I think, uh, bred by the optimism of the of the vaccine we yeah. now see the vaccine hesitancy around the country even resistance to it uh the replication of the virus because of uh uh you know the stall in terms of numbers of people getting the vaccine right all yeah. of this is going to lead to um i i think i think uh, as we go through this reconciliation process uh we need to rethink uh, some of the thinking that went into trimming back these benefits. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I have to say it felt like a slap in the face uh, when Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said, oh, it's appropriate to cut this off. So it's not like she's heartless, but she's basically punting this back to the states. The states have already cut off. We've already seen the states are not compassionate here. Um, states have already cut off. So, uh, 
I'll, I'll kick it back to you, um, Secretary Castro. Look, I, I think a lot of folks are, are watching to say, how are you going to help me tomorrow? Right now, I'm facing having no income and no place to live. I'm curious if you're in touch with the current HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge, um, what those conversations are like, and if you could offer her a piece of advice to immediately address this crisis, what would it be? Well, I, I know that that uh, Secretary Fudge is absolutely committed to making sure that uh, every single person in this country has a safe, decent, affordable place to live. And uh, HUD is doing a lot of work throughout the country to try and make that the case. Of course, resources are always the issue. Uh, we have millions and millions of people out there uh, who uh, are living in a rental affordability crisis. And the fact that this eviction moratorium is lapsing is going to make that worse. By one estimate, about three and a half million people uh, over the next couple of years could lose their homes, including several hundred thousand this year. Other estimates put that even higher. Uh, and so I, I know that I have confidence that Secretary Fudge is uh, doing what she can in providing leadership at HUD. Uh, what I would say is we need to pass this reconciliation package because this reconciliation package actually has uh, over $300 billion of investment for affordable housing, which is, uh, the, which is the largest investment that we will have seen in decades. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people think if you cut people's benefits off, that will force people to return to work. But the data just hasn't bared that out. Yeah. Uh, if you cut people off at the knees and think that's going to make them walk, uh, you know, I think we the three of us well, on this screen know all too well that's not accurate. <laughs> And, and Tiffany, let me just say, that's such an important point, because when I talk to folks out there, I, you know, I go to places, talk to, to uh, folks at restaurants or sometimes um, uh, business owners or others, and they wonder, they say, well, is it these unemployment benefits uh, that are in effect that are encouraging people basically to not to not look for a job, that that's why we're having trouble uh, bringing people in? And you know, research has shown uh, that yeah. that's not the case. That is not the case, uh, not and the it case makes sense to support people. Yeah, absolutely. To all right. I'm so, so sorry, Congressman. We are way over time. I'll just have to have you back. You have to free up your Saturday so you can come back. I'm, I'm really sorry that we have to run. Uh, thank you so much, Julian Castro. And Congressman Mark Takano, I appreciate you making time to be here. Uh, next up, why is the Mexican government suing American gun manufacturers? We're going to explain that after the break. Stay right there. Okay, so get this. An estimated 200,000 firearms are illegally trafficked from the U.S. to Mexico every year. And between 70 and 90 percent of the firearms found at crime scenes in Mexico are traced right back here. So in an unprecedented move, the Mexican government is suing American gun manufacturers to the tune of $10 billion for the damage caused by the flow of weapons trafficked across the border. Why don't Americans try this after every one of our countless mass shootings, you ask? Because usually they can't. The Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act is a federal law that grants broad immunity to gun manufacturers. And the jury's out on whether Mexico will be able to bypass it as well. Joining me now is Yoan Grillo, a Mexican city-based journalist and author of Blood Gun Money, How America Arms Gangs and Cartels. Uh, Yoan, I'm so happy to have you. You know, I um, was looking at these statistics uh, when I was doing research for this segment, and it's baffling. You know, you, we spent so many years of these back people yelling, build a wall. And I thought, why hasn't Mexico been at the border saying build a wall since all of our arms seem to find their way to, to, the, uh, to the southern border? Let me ask, is this lawsuit going to be able to pass this act or is it really more of a symbolic gesture to call attention to the issue? I think there's two sides to this. I mean, one, I mean, there is certainly calling attention to this issue. And this is mind-boggling the scale. I've been here 20 years covering the violence in Mexico. It often really resembles an armed conflict. It's been a humanitarian catastrophe. I mean, more than 300,000 dead over the last decade, mass graves. Uh, and not only Mexico, this spreads to Central America and is really fueling many of the refugees coming to the United States. So it ties many issues together. And I have seen more coverage on this firearms issue, which I've been looking at for many years. It's a mind-boggling scale. But I've seen more coverage over the last month than I have in the last 20 years. So from that side, it does raise attention to the issue at a time that the Biden administration is looking at issues of firearms. But on the other side, 
if you look at many of the big issues in the United States in like tobacco and big pharma, it's often in the courts rather than in you know politics that these issues have changed. And even in the United States, you found that the protection of the commerce is not bulletproof. I mean, you've actually seen families of some of the victims of Sandy Hook suing Remington, who built the gun used in that uh, tragedy. And some, they're making some progress in that case. So this could all have a combined effect and create changes in the firearms industry. <laughs> You know, um, it's interesting here because, you know, there are a lot of Americans who have this weird love affair uh, with with gun uh, with guns. The Washington Post did this incredibly disgusting tone deaf piece on the NRA and Dana Loesch, and they described her as her penetrating dark eyes and sharply defined jawline. Like, who cares? You know, but you've actually interviewed or uh, spoken with some of the U.S. gun manufacturers. I'm curious what's their response uh, to the damage that they're causing in Mexico. Yeah, sure. So I got very the last four years that you know I've been following. So for many years, following the trafficking in Mexico and talking to the traffickers there, and then the last four years, really getting into the firearms industry. And I find one thing is very common among people in the gun industry: it's sealing their own corner. So I talked to one person. I said, are you, "You know, are you concerned if the guns that you sell end up in the hands of these very vicious murderers?" And he said, well, it's not my problem. If I'm doing this legally, I'm selling it to a shop that sells it legally. What's my problem in this? I said, well, even if you're not concerned, how about ethically are you concerned? And he thought for a while and he said, no. <laughs> and I think it was a very <laughs> honest um, response. Yeah. People kind of seal off their own corner. Uh, but I also talk to people, you know, uh, all over the industry, you know, to people in, in the militias themselves uh, and really about going to American gun culture, which is like nowhere else in the world. Uh, but I think this issue can be most people, most American gun owners and most conservatives actually believe in having some kind of sensible uh, regulation of guns. But the kind of fringe are really defining this debate. Yeah. And first of all, it's baffling, but not surprising, I suppose, that the gun manufacturer was not concerned ethically and certainly they aren't uh, concerned morally. Um, but look, the U.S. is not uh, exempt from this. I mean, there are mass shootings that happen here. There's violence that happens here. What's the difference between the gun violence that happens here and how it's handled versus what happens in Latin America, particularly in Mexico? Yeah, sure. I mean, I actually did some research for this in Baltimore, Maryland. And I saw you see a very similar uh, trafficking techniques and ways the guns are acquired in states like Virginia, Georgia, and how they're trafficked to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, as how they're also acquired and trafficked to Mexico. The difference is, and you know, with the violence in Baltimore um, or in places like Chicago uh, and other cities, it tends to affect neighborhoods or, or some towns where in Mexico and Latin America, you see entire states with this level of violence. And then, you know, you see in Mexico, where a lot of the, the majority of firearms deaths in the United States in, in many cities are actually with handguns. You see in Mexico, these squads of 50 people with AK-47s, AR-15s, grenade launchers, 50 cows, which they're actually acquiring in the United States and, and very, very pitched battles. I also looked at yeah. this kind of uh, issue of the mass shootings themselves, including the one in El Paso, um, and how they kind of relate. And uh, I think there's a, a very common thing there. I mean, the violence is very senseless, and people who have lost their loved ones to this violence, whether it's from cartels in Mexico or from a mass shooter in the United States, feel this kind of senseless loss of life. This is something which should not be happening right now. It's definitely something that should not be happening. Thank you so much, uh, Yohan Grillo. You'll have to come back because this uh, lawsuit uh, takes takes uh, takes action. So thank you so much. Don't go in at home because coming up, the pandemic has wreaked havoc on many lives and college students are no exception. Why many are not returning to school this fall. We're going to talk about that next. So not everyone is heading back to college this month. Enrollment has plummeted since the start of the pandemic, with 727,000 fewer undergrads taking classes this spring compared to last spring. Now, according to the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, that plummet is driven by enrollment dropouts at community college, colleges and that just as this headline points out, college students who came from low-income, high-poverty, and high-minority 
high schools are dropping out at disproportionate rates. So now that a new semester is beginning, what does this mean for those left behind? Joining me now is Dr. Will Del Pilar, the Vice President of Higher Education at the Education Trust, and Renika Montgomery, a senior at Howard University. I know all you HU people are happy to see her in her HU <laughs> gear. Uh, thank you both for being here. Um, Dr. Del Pilar, I want to start with you because you bring such great context to this. Um, what is the impact of having students delay their plans or, you know, just their impact of... Uh, uh, being having an adverse uh, impact on their life when it comes to COVID and getting an education? I mean, I think re realistically, uh, we know that students, especially low-income students and students of color, aren't taking a gap year. Um, they're simply uh, not enrolling in higher education, and this has significant, uh, significant long-term effects. We know that good jobs, the, good, the jobs that were created post the last economic uh, recession, went to people who had college degrees, and those jobs were jobs that had retirement benefits and medical benefits. So it has long-term impacts uh, if you don't go to college and earn a degree. Uh, the completely. And I think we're seeing that. So, Renika, I learned about you, my good friend, Dr. Kim Jones. She's a department chair at Howard. Um, and she spoke so highly of you in your circumstance. Now, you are working full time. You're 26 years old, undergrad, and you're so close to graduating. Uh, but you're balancing a full time job and uh, a full being a full time student. Tell me what that's like for you. Um, it's pretty crazy, honestly. Uh, like every day I wake up at like 5 a.m. I get ready for work. I come to work in the morning. I leave work. I go to class. I come back to work. I leave work again. I go to class. I come back to work. And then I stay at work until around 6 p.m. Just to like pretty much like complete my responsibilities. So yeah. Work, it's a long day. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think a, a lot of people. And it does it in there. Absolutely. It's constant. And I think a lot of people look at yeah. this and they say, I know I got this advice as I talked to you a little bit about. Ask your parents for money. Not everybody has that circumstance. Your mother works full time. Um, tell me about your family circumstance. Um, so my mom's a single parent. Um, so even just like entering college, she wasn't able to like uh, help me apply for loans or anything for school. And you look at the bill and you're like, whoa, what am I going to do with that? I've never even seen that much money in my life. And now I have to pay something that costs that much. So um, pretty much it's just my mom. She works full time. She has a really good job. But just because she has a good job and makes decent money doesn't mean that she can afford to help out in any way with, when it comes to school. So I've been working since my freshman year. Yeah, that's uh, and it's very impressive. And I should say you're studying STEM. Uh, you're in the uh, engineering department, something where, you know, yes. there is a delta for black women. So we want to make sure that you stay in school and graduate. Um, Dr. Del Pilar, I know these circumstances are not unique to you. You see this kind of thing all the time, particularly with black and brown students. Um, what what do you think? I mean, do colleges and universities bear any responsibility to make it easier for students? Like, where does the solution lie here? I mean, I think there are lots of solutions out there that, that can address the issues. You know, we have to uh, be realistic. The college isn't affordable in this country. And part of the reason for that is the, the racial wealth gap. We leave students of color with no margin for error. So when you think about the racial wealth gap, the average white household in this country has $156,000 worth of wealth compared to $3,800 for black households and $7,000 for Latino households. And that's why students have to end up working full time to be able to afford college. So if we want to address this, there are policy solutions that we can turn to. We should double the Pell Grant. We should create a federal state partnership to uh, ensure that students can go to college debt free. And we should also, truthfully, we need to invest in student completion and support. So, like students get to college, then a small thing, a, a very small thing like uh, uh, an illness of the family, get, they get derailed and so they can't complete. And so we need to be investing in emergency grants and student support to help them get over the finish line. And uh, you make a good point. For public high schools, where more than 50 percent of the students are black or Latino, the decline is nearly four times that of uh, high schools where the majority of students are white. Renika, we're out of time, but I'm just so curious. For those of us who are not engineers, we may not know all the terminology. Tell me what it is that you want to do when you do graduate, because I know you're going to graduate and do something amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so right now I'm currently working for a GC. And when I graduate, I want to continue working for that GC. Um, in the hopes of pursuing my PE. Um, after that, like, I just feel like the world's my oyster. So I definitely want to do a number of things. 
but definitely stay in the, in like the civil field and just kind of explore different avenues. So that's, that's the plan to start, you know? (laughs) I love that. And I love that, you know, at this point in life, the world is indeed your oyster. So thank you so much (laughs) uh, to uh, Renika um, and Dr. Del Pilar. I appreciate you guys being here for that conversation. And coming up at noon on Alex Witt Reports, new reaction from Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal to Joe Manchin's threats to derail President Biden's infrastructure bill. But up next, don't go anywhere because a definitive history of hip hop. I'm going to talk to one of the creative forces behind a groundbreaking project. You don't want to miss that. So stay tuned. From beatboxing and breakdancing on street corners to selling out the garden in a day to becoming a business worth a milli to a billy. You never thought that hip hop would take it this far. Now, the National Museum for African-American History and Culture, a.k.a. the Blacksonian, as we call it, has officially launched the Smithsonian Anthology of Hip Hop and Rap. Now, this is a 300 page, nine CD project that traces the evolution of the genre as a force in American and world culture. Joining me now is the man who helped curate this important time capsule, Say Adams, he's the founder, founding creative director of Def Jam Recordings. Say, I'm so excited to talk to you about this. I, when my producers emailed this to me, I was like, I'm so into it, let's do it. Um, I love the box set. It's such a comprehensive piece of work. I'm so curious how you could take something, a genre as huge as this, and condense it to this 309 CD set. How did you do that? Well, Tiffany, I have to say that I did not do this by myself. There was a team of advisors that helped everyone from Questlove, Chuck D, MC Light, and obviously that was all spearheaded by Dr. Lonnie Bunch, who now is the secretary of the Smithsonian Institute worldwide. It was a huge team effort. Yeah, I was thrilled to see my friend, my buddy Questlove be a a part of this. So shout out to him for doing that. You know, something that I find interesting, obviously we cover politics here as well as culture. Hip hop has always been such an integral part of the culture, but also very political. And I remember growing up, um, you know, it was Uncle Luke, Two Live Crew, NWA, Ice-T. These people really got Republicans, you know, really in their feelings. Now it's the same thing with like Cardi B and, and other people that they just hone in on. Why do you think that uh, hip hop is the thing that Republicans use to like focus on and, and, and turn something, you know, ugly into something that's so beautiful and, and meaningful to us? Well, ideally, I think that hip hop hits a nerve with everybody, regardless of your demographic. I, I just think it's one of those art forms that just, you know, covers all spectrums and it's obviously, you know, really uh, a, a powerful medium. You know, I remember um, when hip hop first came out and everyone kind of dismissed it as a fad. You know, it was like like disco. You know, this is just going to be a thing. And then it penetrated other outlets. I remember when I you know, would come home from school and I would run and watch Yo! MTV raps. Then it became, you know, prevalent in the fashion industry. And then it started touching every single industry. It certainly was never a fad. Why do you think that it's resonated not just here in America, but across the globe? I mean, it's a culture. It's a movement. It's something that's here forever, really. Well, again, hip hop is youth culture. And so when one group ages out, there's another group that's born into it. My son, for example, is 36 years old. He was born into hip hop in 1984. Everything that he's seen in his lifetime can be reflected in hip hop. That's very interesting because you don't think about it from the younger person's perspective because they've only grown up with hip hop. So I hate to sound like an old curmudgeon, uh, but I do want to ask, you know, you were a part, I'd love your career history. You were a graffiti artist and, you know, transformed that into this beautiful career uh, as the founding creative uh, director for Def Jam. So You know, I listen to some of the more contemporary hip hop that a lot of the younger people like to listen to. I call some of it mumble rap. Um, And I hate to sound like my mom used to sound. It's like, you kids don't know good music. I'm just curious what's your thought about some of the more contemporary music out there since you were such an integral part in the true hip hop that launched this entire genre. Well, what I love today is Little Nas X. The idea that he's pushing boundaries that I never thought I would see in my lifetime in hip hop. 
So to me, something like that is really special. I agree. Lil, Lil Nas X is definitely uh, uh, one of the artists out there doing amazing work and certainly showing how, you know, hip hop can touch different genres. You know, he touched country music and has done some really interesting duets. Um, so, yeah, I, I encourage everybody to check it out uh, at the Blacksonian, which I believe is open here in the nation's capital. Um, and just thank you so much, Say Adams, for pulling together this work. I have to rep for Southern hip hop because I was looking for folks like Outkast and all the Southern folks uh, who also helped change the game. So I appreciate you being inclusive in this body of work. Thanks for joining us today. And I have to tell the audience at home, congratulations are in order for Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. He and his husband, Chaston, they just announced this morning that they have become parents of not one, but two babies, Penelope Rose and Joseph August Buttigieg. That's great news, guys. Congratulations to you both. And coming up tomorrow on the Sunday show with Jonathan Capehart, director and activist Rob Reiner. Meathead, we all love Rob Reiner. He's going to talk about what you need to know when it comes to this California recall. I will certainly be tuned in to Capehart tomorrow morning for that, and I hope you will, too. We'll be right back. All right, thank you so much at home for watching Cross Connection. I'm off next weekend. Whether it's the politics of climate change, the effects of state marijuana laws, or the challenges of racial injustice, get your daily dose of enlightening articles at MSNBC Daily. Written perspectives by people you know and trust, like Alicia Menendez, tackling the issue of immigration, Mehdi Hassan, weighing in on voter suppression, and Frank Figluzzi, writing about national security, along with Michael Steele, offering his take on the Republican Party, Liz Plank commenting on gender issues and others. Plus, a fresh take every morning from me, Hayes Brown. Start your day with MSNBC Daily at msnbc.com.